of God. Let's open our Bibles to Esther chapter 2 and verse 21 and 22. It's going to be the story of Esther and actually the story of Mordecai. One day as Mordecai was on a duty at the king's gate, two of king's eunuchs, Bishtana and Tiresh, who were guards at the door of king's private quarters, became angry at the king Xerxes and plotted to assassinate him. But Mordecai heard about the plot and gave the information to Queen Esther. She then told the king about it and gave Mordecai a credit for the report. I want us to share today a title of a message that will be called Salvation for the Nations. Salvation for the Nations. Our city is composed of different ethnic groups, it's composed of different cultures and it's composed of different languages. Even if we scan right now here we probably have at least 15 or 10 different people from different countries. And so the whole idea of different nations living within our own city is actually real today. You don't necessarily have to travel to different parts of the world to bring the good news to different nations. You have to step out outside of your house, go to the mall and you will see many nations right here in front of your nose. And we must understand that God has a good news for the nations. And we are going to talk, just present a few points, few thoughts today about the importance of bringing people to Jesus and the importance of sharing our faith with other people. If you have your notes, let's just write this down. The first thought that I want to share with you is this, is compassion is the driving force of salvation. Compassion is the driving force of salvation. Mordecai is the man that we are going to focus our topic today on. Mordecai we meet him as a Jewish man in a foreign country. He's in the land of Babylon and he is also a captive. He works in the government and he has some kind of a job over there in the government, a job of high importance and we see the compassion in Mordecai's life in the sense that from the beginning there was a girl named Esther. She was an orphan. She had no parents and Mordecai takes her in and adopts her as her own daughter. Not because they paid good foster care, but because of compassion. We see later on, Mordecai overhears two guys planning an assassin on the king. And instead of washing off his hands and saying, none of my business and I don't want to get involved in this case, just in case they find out I spied on them and then they kill me and my adopted daughter. Mordecai, he takes the risk and goes tells higher authorities that there is an assassination made on the king's life and the king's life is saved because of compassion. Later on we see a plot being written against the whole ethnic group of Jewish people in the Babylonian captivity and Mordecai instead of just running back to Jerusalem or taking all of his savings, all of his retirement fund and running into some unknown land, Mordecai stirs up a trouble puts soil on his head, puts dust on his head, rips his clothes, begins to cry out to God and do everything possible so that his ethnic group is rescued from the plot and God rescues the whole nation. The driving force of his passion for salvation was his compassion for people. In the same story of book of Esther we see a man driven by compassion. And then on the other side we see men driven by cruelty. It is cruel to take somebody's father and to take somebody's mother. It is cruel to assassinate your king. It is cruel to wipe out a whole ethnic group out of your population. Imagine the cruelty of deciding let's wipe out all of the Ukrainians out of Tri-Cities. Or let's wipe out all of the Colombians out of Tri-Cities. It is cruel. That is the world we live in today. The world we live in today does not have a middle ground. It is compassion or cruelty. People who lose compassion cannot stay in the level of complacency too long. Very soon they quickly slide into the other side where the devil works in destroying people through people who yield to cruelty. Every person who steals something operates in cruelty. Every person who 
rapes someone, every person who lies to someone, every person who takes an advantage of somebody operates on the other side of cruelty. On the other side of compassion that is cruelty. We must understand as Christians our goal is not to stay away from cruelty. Our goal is to sink ourselves deep in compassion. Compassion is not an option for Christian. Compassion is not a luxury. It's a necessity. Compassion is a necessity for our survival. Compassion is not an optional. It's not a luxury. It is our essence of being and without that compassion we're all gone. If every person lives without compassion we will have no world to live in. Compassion is to deeply know the suffering of someone else and to have a wish to relieve that suffering. Compassion is to have a deep knowledge of someone else's suffering and to have a deep desire to relieve that suffering. Each person must understand that when God looks at this world, God doesn't see the world we see. God sees the world that is broken and God has compassion for our world. The reason why God has compassion for our world is because it is His world. You may think this world doesn't want to do anything with God. We pushed God out of the schools. We pushed God out of our laws. We pushed God. You can push God all you want to. God still has a claim on this earth because He created it. God loves this earth because He fashioned it. And Satan that we allow into our nation, into our lives, Satan that we allow to run rampant in our streets, that Satan has no concern for our world whatsoever. The only reason he studies us like crazy is because so he can find us, find out how to destroy us better and faster. You know a month ago there was two teenagers who were professionals, broke into our church. They broke the window and they broke the door and they stole one DVD player that records what's going on in the church. And these teenagers were fully acquainted with everything in our building. They were professionals. They knew our building really well. They were here for three hours. They took what they wanted. They didn't care about this building. They didn't care about all the people who donated money to buy the computers, to buy the cameras, to buy the lights. They cared nothing. The only thing they cared about is taking what they wanted. And they learned about this building for one simple reason. To bring destruction. But while they were destroying and while they went upstairs broke the doors and they were taking whatever they wanted in their bags there's another man who walked into this building he was also their age a young man who goes to this building who gives money to this building and who believes that this is his and he walked up upstairs and he sees two teenagers with bags walking out and he says what are you guys doing here and they said we're uh, fooling around whatever that's supposed to be nowadays <laughs> fooling around he says and this teenager this young man picks up a phone call and calls me and says Vlad there's two people I don't think they should be here you have to get over here and I remember we came over there and I looked at these teenagers I said what are you guys doing I looked the broken window I look at the broken door and you have to understand I didn't just simply let them go you said you're a pastor that's true but that's my building that's what I tithe that's what I pray and that's where our people go it's mine now they might broke into it. They might stole stuff from it. They might know more about this building, how to break in. But at the end of the day, it is mine. And because it's mine, I get passionate for it. You have to understand when God looks at this earth, guys, that's how God looks at this earth. It is His. When He sees demons running around stealing and taking stuff, God doesn't just simply go off and says, Oh, I understand these humans don't want me. God says, No, that's my world. These are my people. Not like that. Not so fast Satan. That demon, that demonic curses, those sins, not so fast. I know they don't want me now but God says no, no, no. This is mine. God's compassion rests on the fact this earth is not Satan's. This earth doesn't belong to sin. This earth was fashioned and made by God and God has a claim for this earth and He has a right to be compassionate and passionate for this earth. Can somebody say amen. I have a claim on our building and I remember I talked to this teenager I told him my story how I stole and got trapped and how God changed my life 15 years ago and they're like oh that's praise God praise God God's gonna change our lives I'm like yes he will but I'm like until police got involved in my life my life didn't change they said oh no 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 not like that I was like oh the Holy Spirit will use a police officer today in your life 
and the police officer came and they arrested them they put them in the back seat of the car you know and I looked at the teenager young man who plays in our worship team who was passionate for what was happening here he didn't let those thieves run away and he didn't let those thieves take whatever he wants it's okay guys I'm sorry you probably have guns I'm just gonna back away why when it's yours you fight for it that's how God looks at this humanity we have to stop giving our city to the hands of the devil we have to stop giving our generation to the hands of demons listen just because the demons are running rampant and destroying their lives that doesn't mean they created their lives demons don't care about people they care so much about people just like those two teenagers cared about a building care nothing sin and Satan he will give you just a little bit just to hook you up but he has no concern for you whatsoever and the reason why devil studies you is so he can destroy you faster God studies how many hairs are on your head so he can love you better so he can bless you better so he can protect you better God is concerned because you are God's property whether you're living in sin today or whether you're away from God today I want to tell you something God has a special claim on your life you may push him away you may become so educated do you see I don't need God in my life but I gotta tell you God has a special concern and care for your life he is concerned for you when devil is destroying you he doesn't sit on the throne and says well rebellious little sheep they will go to heaven to hell and they will pay for their sins no God's heart moves the same way if I see somebody kidnapping a building even if they're bigger than me something inside of me we're not gonna run for the highway I'm gonna run inside I'm gonna pick a fight why because it's mine try to run over a sprinkler in my yard <laughs> it's my sprinkler you don't know how that sprinkler works you don't know how deep it is I know everything about the sprinkler because I put the sprinkler in and I care about the sprinkler how much more God cares about every human being that he planted on this earth they are his people can somebody say amen You know there was a guy in the Bible his name was Jonah he was the prophet and God sends him to tell Jericho to tell uh, Nineveh says go preach to them that I, I will destroy them if they don't repent Jonah says no he gets a ship goes completely the other way God wakes him up through a storm they throw Jonah into the big whale Jonah eventually survives the whale, whale vomits him out on the beach Jonah goes into the city has no kindness whatsoever no compassion whatsoever here's God gave him a second chance for disobeying him by letting a fish swallow him without like killing him I mean you should be going around to people say guys I'm a prophet but I'm such a disobedient prophet God has been so good to me you know what guys God is a God of second chances God can forgive you too just repent you know Jonah's message was in 40 days you're dead you're all dead 40 days start counting 40 days the city will be destroyed God will destroy the city Jonah did you forget how merciful God was to you no. preaches it preaches it preaches it and he's done with preaching goes out of the city and the Bible says he sits on the hill he's watching for the city to be destroyed he has a countdown his countdown wasn't until the conference till destruction he probably had his GoPro ready all of his videos ready demolition of the city <laughs> it'll be a YouTube hit and after 40 days the city wasn't destroyed imagine 120,000 people were rescued on one day this would be a good celebration you know what Jonah had depression Jonah fell into depression because 150 people got saved and God came to Jonah and says Jonah what is wrong with you I saved 120,000 people you should at least have a smile I'm not asking you to cook a cake and through a party like my angels do I'm asking you at least have a joy in your heart and Jonah mad he says God I knew you're gonna save them and God says to Jonah and what is wrong with that I saved you that's somehow not good enough huh and God teaches Jonah a lesson the next day God allows a plant near Jonah grow really really fast and the Bible says first time in the book of Jonah Jonah rejoiced the word rejoice there means deliriously rejoiced extravagantly he got excited he never got happy when God saved him didn't get happy when God saved 120,000 people you know what he got happy when a plant grew fast you see misplaced priorities misplaced compassion and it provoked the heart of God 
you know what God did the next day he sent a little spider kill the plant and kill the plant withered Jonah gets a headache and complains again and there God comes to him and says Jonah you didn't care when I saved you you didn't care when I saved 120,000 people but you are caring about a life of a green plant where are your priorities how many of us care more about the life of our plant called iPhone the rims on the car few new followers on Instagram oh there's this new makeup that's coming up there is this new wardrobe that's coming up that's available our plan that we're so excited but the things about people ah, that's not of concern for us let's be a people who put a compassion in the right place let's not protect plants nothing wrong with protecting plants God bless you all your tree huggers love the environment we have to love the earth it is our given to us but if we love the plants above the people our compassion is misplaced if we save dolphins and kill babies in the womb our compassion is misplaced if we fight so we protect those few rare species in the ocean yet we don't fight for those who are lost least and lost we have misplaced our compassion it's good to have a nice house, it's good to have nice clothes, it's good to have good education, it's good to be popular, it's good to be known, it's good to be influential, it's good to be knowledgeable and educated. But at the end of the day, if you have no compassion for souls, your priorities are misplaced. Don't care about plants, care about people. Can somebody say amen? You know I see in my parents house, my brother got a German Shepherd, a little April, a little female German Shepherd and, and and no I will admit that thing is cute <laughs> that thing is just adorable as long as you come and see it and it doesn't stay in your house but once it stays in your house it destroys everything just come it's an animal beast you should see my siblings how much attention how much adoration that little poor animal gets how much kind words that poor animal gets and there's nothing wrong with loving your animal please I'm not anyway saying you should love people and go around and beat your animal don't do that <laughs> love your animal treat your animal post pictures with your animal but at the end of the day if your animal gets kind words and your mom gets cuss words your compassion is misplaced <laughs> if you tell your brat shut up and you tell your enemy come look goody come come your compassion is misplaced compassion always on people not animals and not plants can somebody say amen let's write down point number two to save people we need to defeat the plot of the enemy through prayer to save people we need to defeat the plot of the enemy through prayer Mordecai in both of the cases where he saved the life of a king and where he saved his nation he didn't save those people until first he defeated the plot of the, the plot of the enemy salvation is not just you telling people they need Jesus salvation is first you going in a spiritual world and destroying the plan and the plot of the devil and then it helps those people to be saved we see Mordecai hears about the plot of killing the king and he goes in not to save the king he goes in to destroy the plot and when the plot is destroyed the king is saved when his nation has a plot against them they have a law against them Mordecai doesn't go and trying to get all the people together and hide in the caves he goes in his main attack is let's destroy the plan of the enemy because in destroying the plan of the enemy we save the people the enemy plans to kill see most of us when we talk about salvation we get it wrong we first think when it comes to salvation that means I need to walk out of my house and I need to go tell my neighbor to come to church that is not where salvation begins salvation begins first with compassion and secondly salvation is warfare when you're trying to save a soul you're not just dealing with the human you are dealing with the enemy who has a plot to destroy them and if the enemy's plot is not destroyed a soul will not be saved now a soul can raise their hand but their life won't be changed 
a person can even come to church but their life won't be transformed because that devil that power of the enemy holds them hostage and will draw them back to their old sins that's why in our church we have morning prayers that's why from four in the morning five in the morning till ten o'clock people come and we pray for that reason why do we pray after worship why do we pray constantly on Friday night prayers because to see our city give the lives to Jesus it's not just about inviting people to church it's about in the spiritual world breaking the grip of the enemy that holds them hostage in their addictions in their problems so when the enemy's plot is broken people will be free and they will come and serve Jesus Christ because somebody say amen since 9-11 United States has increased their security CIA FBI and the security the, the police officers have went up when it comes to their protection of our nation since that time if I'm not mistaken 53 terrorist attacks have been stopped three of them were stopped by luck it was an accident that they got stopped and four they couldn't stop them and those terrorist attacks succeeded they were on a smaller scale but they still succeeded 53 terrorist attacks were stopped why were people saved because the FBI the CIA the police officers the government understands in order to save American population we don't just pro protect and hide American population somewhere in the cave we have to search detect all the plots of terrorists and stop them see you didn't even know these plots existed they did because when you rest and sleep they are awake and they're fighting the plots of the enemy so that you will be saved that's why you need to wake up in the morning and pray so that our city can be saved and they will be coming and getting saved they're like oh this is praise God but they don't know somebody's been fighting the terrorists somebody's been fighting demons somebody's been fighting the devil and saying devil let your hands go of these people and then God will save those people salvation of people doesn't happen an accident it's not just well we want to see people saved well I want to see my uncle stop smoking and drinking well I want my mom to stop you know cheating I want my father to stop being angry that's not it works like that you have to stop praying first before you just start talking to people so the plot of the enemy is broken in Jesus name I remember when about seven or eight years ago um, I have first time heard about uh, Alexandra Alexandra the, the young lady who was singing today and uh, somebody I think her neighbors told us they were coming to our church and they said hey there's this girl and um, she has an amazing voice and uh, we are inviting her to church and so as they told us that they're inviting her to church two months before she actually came to our services I remember I started to seriously start praying for her life I started to actually in prayer bind demons that she will come to church and because I heard she had a fourth uh, opera voice instead of Washington I was like Lord Jesus the devil's gonna really try to hold her back from our church and I want her to come and serve and worship God in our church we prayed and prayed and prayed and finally one Thursday we didn't have a Wednesday service but Thursday nights on Thursday night uh, the, she was here there was a worship team from Generation for Truth they were leading worship and the youth pastor was speaking and so he spoke really good message but at the end he didn't give an altar call and I was kind of upset I was like whoa here's this person we've been praying for and she's here and he's not giving the altar call I remember I took the microphone from him at the end and I had the spirit of boldness that came upon me and I mean we had a very small group of people and I remember I closed my eyes and I just tried to just just I was just I lost it I just went all out just just really just you just need to give your life to Jesus and everything and then at the end I was like you just need to run to the front and then I opened it and lo and behold Alexandra was standing right in the front she gave her life to Jesus she rededicated her life to Jesus you know many years passed you know today not only she worships with us but she's in the staff in our church how do you see a person come to God not by just begging and pleading with them by fighting and winning a battle in the spiritual world can somebody say amen I remember the same thing happened with a young man that we brought to Jesus Edder he moved to New York he gets married and then after a while um, his wife writes to us and says Edda wants to leave me 
and I said what do you mean he wants to leave he was so in love with you for years he met you on myspace when he was came into this country he what do you mean he wants to leave you? he said he wants to leave me and so I remember when I called Eder and I said hey uh, you know why don't you want to leave your wife I mean what's wrong with you he's like uh, bro she's too good for me I was like there's no man in this wide world who will ever leave his wife because she's too good to me that's kind of like I'm gonna leave a hundred bucks in the, in the sewer why because they're too good I was like are you even listening to yourself and when I told him that he realized that when he said that to me I realized one thing the problem I'm dealing with is not a guy who wants to leave his wife it's a curse because everyone in his family and her family were not married they always fail in their marriages and I remember I hang up the phone with him I texted Martin who was in Africa and I said Martin you're over there in, in closer to TP Joshua heaven is closer there we are gonna pray here but I want you to say a few prayers out there. I know they'll get there faster before us. And I'm like, I ask you to pray against generational curses in his family. We, I started to pray here a few months later. I followed up on him and I found out Edo doesn't leave his wife. Like the previous people in his family. All of uncles and aunties do. He doesn't do that why that happened Be not just because I sent him to counseling not just all of that is very important but because when the plot of the enemy is destroyed a person's life will be saved when the plot is destroyed you can't save a life without destroying something you gotta destroy something first see the reason why people get saved on Wednesday night is because a lot of destruction happens on Wednesday morning a lot of destruction when we pray against the enemy some people look at that as like a cultic kind of prayers chanting screaming out loud if you would have your physical eyes open and see the demonic realm you will be running around crazy yelling and screaming against those devils yourself because the enemy hates people and we need to destroy his plan if we want to save other people's lives can somebody say amen can somebody say praise the lord I heard a testimony yesterday of a young lady um, I think it was Myra when she started to come to our church she got saved and then she started to pray for her sister she started to really pray for her sister and her sister she would invite her sister to come to church and her sister just you know wouldn't come she had this and that and this and that and next thing that happened is that she continued to pray she continued to literally just bind those demons say God I just pray that you will break through in a spiritual world that things will change and one day on Sunday morning her sister drives to the 20th street and for no reason to her without being invited without an any um, special thing drives by our church pulls into our parking lot calls her sister and says where are you at because I am here at the church comes on Sunday comes on Wednesday gives her life to Jesus on Wednesday and now goes to home group and her life is seeing changes we must understand church prayer is not just we want to be all spiritual that's not that it's because the secret of revival is destroying the plot of the enemy if you're praying for if you're talking to somebody who you see they're not they're not catching there's anger there's issues continue to pray for them don't give up destroy the plot of the enemy their life will be saved. Can somebody say amen? Let's put our hands together for the Lord one more time. Let's quickly go on point number three is the salvation of one leads us to salvation of many. Salvation of one leads us to salvation of many. We see when Mordecai saves a life of a king, it promoted him eventually to save a life of the whole ethnic group a people who save cities are the people who first save souls we must enlarge our vision and our vision cannot just be to save myself my family it starts there but it has to also encompass everyone in our city and everyone in our region now people may accuse us of thinking too big not being down to earth having our mind in the sky why did Mordecai aim to save the whole ethnic group? What well, did he have the resources for that? Was he anointed for that? Did he have the connections for that? No. Did you know why Mordecai had to keep a big vision? He was trying to keep up with his enemy's plans. I want you to write this down. The scope of Satan's plan is the clue of the size of our vision. 
the scope of Satan's plan is the clue to the size of our vision. Let me ask you a question. How many cities Satan has on his plan to attack in our city? How many people? Does he come up in the morning and say, I am so tired. You know what? It's been 6,000 years. I'm just sick and tired of tormenting these people. You know what? I'm just going to take a vacation and I'm going to leave Trey cities alone. If Satan ever says that, I'm going to tell you how many people we're going to save. Zero. Because everybody's going to be fine. If Satan comes to our city and says, I'm so busy with Africa, India, Siberia. I'm so busy with destroying North Korea. I'm so, Afri I'm so busy there. I'm just going to send just few people, few demons to destroy just, just the middle school. And that's it. I'll leave the high schools alone. They're not going to be raping one another, hurting one another, cutting themselves, skipping school. They're not going to be sleeping around. They're not going to be doing all of these sins. They're not going to be drive-by shootings. None of that will happen in high school. Only middle schoolers will have problems. Then our vision is only for middle school unfortunately satan's plan is a little bit bigger than that he has a plan for the kids for the teenagers for the high schoolers for college students he has the plan for the young adults who are in college and university he has the plan for those who just got married he has the plan for those who have kids he has plan for those who are empty nesters he has plan for the grandpas and grandmas and that's the size of our vision it has to be consistent with the scope of satan's plan we cannot afford to think smaller than Satan's thinking. He spreads his web on the whole city and we have to spread our vision on the whole city. You may say, how could we do it? It's funny how Satan doesn't ask those questions. He comes on God's territory. He's a lesser than God. And he doesn't ask the question, how can I destroy people if God owns this earth? He still does it. And demons help him. If we don't focus on how but we say our God is on our side and we will fight the enemy and we will have a big vision to see our people, our city and our ethnic group serve God. The Holy Spirit will give us the power. If Mordecai can do it, my friends, we will do it as well. Can somebody say amen. Our cities are for God. Try cities is for Jesus. Young generation is for Jesus. Teenagers is not for drugs, self-mutilation and abuse. Teenagers are for Jesus Christ. Young adults is not for sleeping around AIDS and all kinds of sin. It is for Jesus. I know some of you may be looking and saying, well, you don't know man, you don't know man. No, you don't know man. My God is bigger. And those demons tormenting people's lives, they are smaller and with God we will overcome. Can somebody say amen? People with vision will conquer and you and I are the person of vision. Can somebody say amen? amen? I want you to write down the last and the fourth thing. The king, when you save others, the king will rescue you. When you save others, the king will rescue you. There was a time when Mordecai, when he saved the king, he adopted Esther. And then the king, the Mordecai was so busy trying to save a whole ethnic nation. But there was a guy who really didn't like him. His name was Haman. Haman hated Mordecai so bad that he on his own backyard designed gallows, really high place to hang Mordecai. He was planning to destroy Jewish people. But before that he wanted to do like a little appetizer and hang Mordecai. And see when Mordecai saved the king's life it was says that it went into the book of records and but Mordecai never got a gift. Mordecai never got applauded. Nobody ever brought him on a pedestal and say hey here's a, here's a crown, here's a Starbucks gift or here's a new car. You saved the king's life. I mean this is such a big accomplishment. He got no reward whatsoever but Mordecai still goes on to saving other people. I just want to encourage somebody here. Don't ever be offended if you're doing good and you don't get rewarded. Whatever is not rewarded is not forgotten. Whatever is not rewarded is not forgotten. Haman has this beautiful plan. After breakfast he decides to go into king's court. Ask the king if he can hang Haman on the backyard of his house. He walks into the court and before he says a word the king says, Haman I have a question for you. Because you have to pause and go back. The night before the king couldn't sleep for some weird reason. 
and th those kings what they would do to help them go back to sleep is they would read something like a phone book which really helps you to fall asleep is they would bring chronicles chronicles is the history of everything that happened they would bring chronicles and this guy with a monotone voice would sit by the king and read through it to help the king fall asleep because nothing helps you fall asleep than the boring speech sometimes I hear one of the best criticism I get for my message like my, your sermons really helped me to fall asleep and they mean it for good but usually it means for bad and so what happens is this guy would read the chronicles of the king he would read all of the things and as the king is trying to fall asleep there comes a point where the guy reads in a monotone voice and there was a Mordecai who spotted two assassins who wanted to kill the king and the king instead of falling asleep he wakes up and he says and what was done to Mordecai you read about all of these meetings that I had I don't care about them but guys saved my life what did you guys do uh king uh, let me check let me check Not, nothing you mean to say a Mordecai got not not got rewarded for saving my life they said yeah the king didn't even go to sleep after that he sits there and starts thinking I should have died there but this guy saved my life how can I reward him here comes Haman who wants to kill Mordecai what trips Haman's plans the fact that he messed with the wrong person you never want to mess with the person who saves somebody's life because when you have all the plans prepared to destroy them the king of all kings will look and say wait he's been saving people I'm not just gonna mess all of your plans Satan and when Haman comes in has everything prepared everything just needs a signature from the king the king interrupts everything and says there is a man in our kingdom I want to honor Haman immediately thinks there is nobody in the kingdom better than me of course he wants to honor me so Haman goes all cocky on himself he says king I want you to take that man put him on your own horse give him your clothes and let the most noble of your princes walk in front of that man and scream this is the man the king wants to honor and the king says is there anything else we can do king but just just really make him feel special the king says you know what I like that could you go and do that to this man named Mordecai that's exactly the man he wanted to assassinate this morning Haman's pride got crushed nothing is more embarrassing than honoring the man you're trying to hang but he had to do that because the king says so and that's where Haman's life went downhill from there my friends when we save people there will be times when things might not be going well in our life it's not gonna be our prayers that will bring change in our personal lives it will be the fact that God saw we agreed with the heart of God and God will touch our case and save our life and our situation because we saved others when Jesus was hanging on the cross his critics says said this of him Matthew chapter 27 he saved others himself he cannot save they were messed with the wrong man when you put a man who lived his life saving others on the cross and you dare to compliment him by saying he saved others I think God in heaven at that moment says you have no idea who you're messing with you're not messing with the man who made a living for himself you're messing with the man who gave his life for others and when they put him down put a biggest rock and put God waited until everything got so bad that God could step in and mess everything up so bad and Pharisees had to create the dumbest idea to fake Jesus' resurrection. They had to tell and pay soldiers to go and tell everybody, say this message. Tell everyone, while we slept, disciples stole the body. Now, turn on your logic for a moment. How could you see who steal something when you sleep? That's pure. Kindergartners could come up with a better lie than Pharisees did why were they so foolish because that's how God embarrasses the plots of the enemy who mess with the saviors God will humiliate he will destroy the plots of the enemy why because God loves people who save 
and God will defend people who save even if the enemy maybe will have it will laugh and mock you but listen God will always have the last laugh and God will raise you up he will remove the stone and he did not remove the stone to let Jesus out he removed the stone to show us Jesus is not even there that's what God's gonna do for you and he's gonna do for me when we save other people God will save us God will save our situation God will rescue us out of our dilemma and we will be like Mordecai God will honor us not because we sought to honor ourselves but we sought to honor his name and to honor his cause in our generation can somebody say amen please don't be foolish today don't live your life for yourself don't try to pick your life by your own shoelaces don't try to promote yourself at the expense of other people there is a God in heaven and he watches everything yes you may succeed for a year or two but at the end God will move his big finger because in his records it will say there's men and there's women who saved others but they didn't get rewarded and God will reward them and those who destroyed others God says you know what you're gonna have to take the back seat because I'm gonna honor those who save other people can somebody say amen with the